Sita Sagran is a personal development trainer, lifestyle consultant, and a motivational speaker. She's, uh, you know, certified in various techniques around hypnotherapy, NLP, and she's also the member of Toastmasters International USA for the last 16 years. Sita is the co-author of the motivational book, Your Dose of Motivation, which was published in 2020. She has shared some of the lessons from her life and attempted to simplify the concept of self-motivation. A recipient of Global Training and Development Leadership Award in 2017 and the Exceptional Women of Excellence Award in 2020, the key focus of all of Sita's training and motivational workshops and keynote sessions are on individual development through interactive learning and mutual empowerment. Sita's training programs and motivational sessions have also emphasized on the attainment of inner peace, well-being, and you know the participants' confidence. She's conducted corporate educational sessions all over the world and has also attended conferences in the UAE, India, Sri Lanka, and Singapore as a keynote motivational speaker. She's currently based out of United Arab Emirates. Thank you so much, Sita, for joining us. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you so much, Abhinav. Lovely to be here with you on this uh, session. Thank you, you for inviting me. Did the introduction do justice? Because I know that you've been around for a really long time in the field and, you know, our podcast pretty much tries to cover the various aspects that you've done in the field for various number of years. So thank you so much for taking our time. It's a pleasure. The pleasure is absolutely mine. Thank you. So uh, what do you say? We just dive right into it, Sita? Absolutely. Done. So could you tell, you know, the listeners your story and, you know, what makes you the person you are at the moment? Okay, I think that's, uh, I'm not sure if I, it might be a rather long story, but I will keep it short. Uh, basically, I am, I'm, I'm from India and I have been residing here in Dubai uh, for a very, very long time. So uh, I've been here for a very long time and I grew up here. And the part uh, for my degree, which I did in India, the rest of my education has been in Dubai. And uh, I, I was not someone who had any inclination of being in, 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 in the profession that I am currently in. Mm -hmm. So this was a profession that came to me during my journey of um, self-development. And uh, it, I think it would have strictly started around uh, probably 16 years ago, 16 oh. to 17 years ago. And when I had started off on the journey, it was basically learning things which appealed to me, which I enjoyed. And of course, human behavior is a subject that I've always found extremely fascinating. And uh, that is how I began the journey. And many years down the line, I realized that this is what I would like to be in. And this is the profession that I would like to be in because it gave me tremendous joy. And at the same time, it enabled me to reach out to people and help people in my own small way. That Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, you know, something that we are really keen on here in the Inside Project podcast, and I think we discussed this with Sita as well, and even the listeners know this, that we're all about trying to see how personal development can come into being. One of the major things that we try to see is, you know, transformational ideas that could have been taught to us when we were younger in school. Those are also some kind of things that we wanted to ponder upon. So Sita, uh, what's missing in our education system, you know, that you feel deters the complete growth of humans? I think if we are to look at the educational system all over the world, you have different, different curriculums. You have different educational systems in place. So it would be difficult for me to categorically talk about one specific one without uh, ruffling feathers, let's put it. <laughs> However, what I would uh, term education to be is, it is definitely something which can be extremely powerful if we use it to make the world a better place. And with that perception, if we are looking at education, I would say we need to do away with rote learning, with the marking scheme, focusing on theories, okay. and of course, uh, unbiased Teaching practices, yes, I talk about that also here because uh, when I was growing up, I was never a good student. And what I have always observed is it's only those children who have shown particular academic brilliance 
who have generally noticed and uh, taken up for various activities in the school. Unfortunately, those who may not be showing any kind of capability at, at a glance just do not get a chance many a time. Okay. So, okay. which I think also is a rather unfavorable for the many who may not be really shining during those years. And apart from that, I think even coaching, the extra coaching which is encouraged uh, is also something we need to do away with, including tuitions. Plus, of course, a very orthodox approach to education. When I say orthodox, I'm talking about how, how many of us really look at or consider education to be something whereby our child can absolutely realize, make a realization of the true potential? Do we look at education from that perspective? Or are we wondering, okay, which school is the best? Which school basically gives off high ranking students or children who get excellent jobs? Now, is that what we consider education to be? So I think we need to first of all consider what education is before we decide to put a child into a program. What do you say, Abhinav? So it's a very fair point, Sita. In fact, a very interesting point also that comes up from it. A, a very important aspect would be for parents to be able to understand that this is what my child's potential looks like and maybe I should try and consider aligning his education with what you know, he or she is good at. And not worry about uh, the the you know the type of school or the kind of courses that they offer. If I'm not wrong, that's what you were trying to say as well, Sita. Yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. I, I, you're quite right, Abhinav. And another thing I think which we need to consider is education need not be something that we have to look at from within the four walls. I mean, let, let us think that it it is something which can enrich a person's life through experiences as well, experiential learning. So for that purpose, I think that the way how education is taught to children needs to be reformed, let's put it, and of course through project work. And uh, at the same time, currently, I think in schools, we don't have a concept of enabling a child to work, let's say maybe it could be during their holidays, perhaps their summer break, mm -hmm. or it could even mm -hmm. be six months during their high school period. If they are allowed to work in an organization or in a, in, in a certain workplace that they might probably like to learn or implement what they have studied. I think that is also a great way of enabling a child to enjoy education rather than having the focus on the final term exams, Correct. which may not be something which all children can excel in. Correct. You're absolutely right. It kind of reminds me of this model that I had read and I'm sure you must already be aware of this, the Bloom's taxonomy which uh, pretty much talks about, uh, you know, when any educational uh, a syllabus is created, it is always around, you know, the capability of a child to learn, to remember, to understand, uh, evaluate, and then towards the end, create something. Now, most of our schools have the creation aspect very small. Like it's only remembering, learning, and then, you know, blurting it all out in the exam. What you're also trying to say maybe for the listeners is that, hey, why don't we try and see uh, how we as parents or we as even teachers can make sure that the creating aspect, the practical aspect of everything that we're trying to teach our kids can be a bigger pie than just, you know, a small uh, homework or something, which does not at the end, let your child learn and apply the concepts that they, you know, we're trying to instill in them. Yes, absolutely. And I'm glad you talked about teachers here because I think currently, I believe in many parts of the world, teachers are paid far less than what they actually deserve. Right. Because if you, and if you look at uh, some of the, 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 the countries where uh, education system is extremely successful, let's say uh, you know, countries where you know, it could be the, the Scandinavian countries, it could be like Finland and, uh, or Denmark, or of course even Japan or South Korea. If you're looking at uh, such places, I think uh, definitely this is something we need to keep in mind that teachers need to be paid well and they also need to experience continuous professional development oh, so that they are also very much 
in time. They, they are also very much aware of what needs to be updated so that they are able to bring in the best educational experience for the students. Absolutely right. Uh, one thing is to make sure that the syllabus is more towards the creation aspect for kids. And yes, the teachers themselves need to continuously go through, uh, you know, training so that they are well informed and then they can pass on the same to the kids. Absolutely. True. They're very true. And that goes for the curriculum as well. It, I think ideally for an educational system to be successful at a global level, if we are talking about how it can impact the entire world, is by probably planning and uh, creating a universal curriculum that is created by experts. Mm -hmm. Experts who, who are, of course, uh, leaders in the subjects that are going to be provided for the children as part of their curriculum. Correct. Because this is also going to ensure a very high quality because when someone who is not just a, a professional or an expert in their field, if they are asked to create a, a module or a program that will enable t uh, children to learn the best possible way, their subject, I'm, I'm sure they're going to bring in that passion Absolutely. into how they would like the child to learn and at the same time make it very interesting. The other thing would be to, I think, incorporate, of course, new technologies. I think. 2020 and I think we are still continuing with the practice of online learning mm -hmm. because of the pandemic and I think uh, this this period has also created better awareness about how we need to urgently incorporate new technology into learning mm -hmm. because uh, there is no other way than to transform the current style of learning into something which is a lot more modern and a lot more progressive. Correct. Another thing Correct. I think I, which comes to my mind is about research and development, because uh, I think while there is a lot of innovation which is being done as far as industrial research goes in many countries, I'm not sure how many countries are actually investing in academic research. Right. Because that also will create a whole different educational program, which will be focusing a lot on quality and excellence. Absolutely. And, and as far as school funds are, go, are going, I'm not sure how well uh, are the school <laughs> funds being utilized, uh, Abhinav. Can I, can I have your take on that? How well do you think currently the school funds are being managed? I mean, I wouldn't really know much around that angle, to be very honest. When I do speak to schools or, or corporates, my, my capacity comes in the line of being a team building a trainer. So when I go and speak with them, they, their funds for even schools or companies are there for learning and development. But how do they allocate their funds? I might not be very privy of that. But yes, there is one thing that the requirement, you know, that trigger that, hey, something needs to be changed in the way that we are delivering learning to these kids or delivering learning in LNDs and corporates, that trigger has not formed yet. And unless and until that trigger is not presented or is not present within the school authorities, I feel until then we might not be in the ideal state that we are trying to create. Because what we're trying to say is learning methodologies have to be changed. Attention deficient uh, participants need a different way of being, uh, you know, streamlined when we're trying to impart something to them. That sort of trigger has not formed yet. And if that sort of trigger is not formed yet, I'm assuming, and I might be wrong, that the money might not be allocated towards those and might be allocated towards other things like, you know, just technological development, just infrastructure development. Because kids can come on the tablet, kids can learn from these computers, but they still need to know how to absorb that information. So True. that is something that I think schools, if they aren't already allocating funds there, should allocate. So I think you are uh, definitely con con conveying what needs to be conveyed because how, how well uh, the school funds are being utilized, I think is a very critical point there. Absolutely. Because what, what happens is, is the school utilizing the funds so that the educational program, the educational experience is something which children enjoy 
or is it just being utilized for things they consider as important for the student? Correct. Correct. So I think that that creates a huge challenge there because for, if for which the tra to... for which the trainers and teachers themselves need to be continuously evolving so that they know exactly yes. what is required in order to you know or use those funds uh, appropriately or justifiably. So absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And, and I think as far as the school curriculum goes, or let's say the education program, which many a time starts its kindergarten, I, I personally believe that uh, it is not perhaps a great idea to send children to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think unless, of course, the children both are work, I mean, the, the parents, sorry, both of them are working and they need to have their child in a very safe environment whereby they can leave their children in a daycare. But otherwise, I'm not sure if really a kindergarten is necessary for a child to be, you know, to, to think that it is a stepping stone to educational journey. If you, if you look at some of the countries where the education system is extremely admired, you, you may be surprised or you would definitely know that children start schooling much later. True. And so I think that, that is another, uh, I think, area which I have noted from parents especially because a sense of competition so that their child can excel is so strong that it begins, unfortunately, at a very, very young age for many parents. Very interesting, uh, Sita. So at the first level of information that we've spoken about are the learning methodologies. Mm -hmm. How do we impart certain, impart certain, uh, certain learning method methodologies? And the second aspect post that is, mm -hmm. when the learning is imparted, the person, the child in the school or a job seeker or an entrepreneur needs to know how to absorb that and then execute on their goals. Now, you've been in this field of English, psychology, counseling, what is it that you've learned from your experiences that a student, uh, a job seeker, or even an entrepreneur, anybody listening to this podcast, how can they best execute on their goals? So you are basically asking about um, how to overcome. Is it inertia or is it about time management or is it about their own personal and professional development, Abhinav? I believe it can be across all gamuts. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're basically talking about the journey that we make to realization of our goals. I, I would say it begins with a sense of belief here, uh, Abhinav. Because unless we have a certain belief, it is very difficult for us to then make the change in our behavior, in our habits, in our action, and of course, that will lead us to the achievement of what we have started out on. Because I, I remember if I'm to look at my own journey, and many, many years ago, it, it wasn't until I had come to a sense of realization of what I am and what I would like to do in the process, whereby the journey really started. Because after my educational, the, my, my degree had got over, I wasn't yet certain what, what is the, the track I would like to move forward in. So I think uh, the, the first, I think the dawning of realization came with the belief, with the belief that yes, uh, there was a, the project which I wanted to complete. And after the completion of that, it, it had given me a certain sense of purpose a certain sense of confidence as well that, uh, yes, I would like to move towards this track and this is what I would like to do because I feel confident about it. So I think it starts with the belief. And once the belief came into the picture, it was about changing my behavior so as to move towards the realization of that belief. So if I, if I were to actually talk about uh, how did the behavior change, I would then have to talk about my habits because I realized that there were several habits in the day which were not really complementing me in, in, in my achievement or in my journey towards achievement of my goals. 
So I had to change, make changes to those habits to, to the, and replace it with desirable habits that will enable me to reach my goals. And of course, once the habits came into picture, it was about the actions. So then the habits, the next step would be the actions that follow the habits. Absolutely. Yes, Sita. Thank you so much. Before we go on to the action stage, wanted to still something very interesting you brought, brought out about uh -huh. beliefs. And uh, not to, you know, digress into the elements of neuro-linguistic programming or even hypnotherapy for that matter. People generally create mental models in their brain right from a very early childhood because that's what that's why it's called formative years right certain experiences around you what you see what you have around mm -hmm. you creates belief models for you yeah. so uh, at that point in time let's assume you got a belief model which is divergent from what you actually want to adopt as a belief how do you make sure that you change those belief systems because that's what is primarily required for you, right? Before you identify the habits that are stopping you and before you delve into action, your belief systems have to be in place. How does that belief shift happen? I think when we talk about belief system, we will have to also touch upon the early childhood years Absolutely. or the environment that you grow up in. Because, uh, and I'm not uh, in or stating that uh, the environment is the only factor that plays a role in your belief system, but the environment plays a very strong role. Because as far as I'm concerned, I grew up in an environment where I had a lot of freedom to evolve into the character that I am today. I'm not sure exactly how many people may have had that privilege to evolve into who they wish to be in their own pace and time. So I think that also makes it very different for person to person. Because if you are coming from a family background where there are certain systems already in place as far as expectations from a child, there could be a certain rigidity also which comes into the child. In other words, to learn something which is not what you may have been taught when you were young, maybe a little more harder. If you have probably been brought up in a very rigid belief structure due to your environment. So I think uh, the belief system does play a role. And yes, the impact of the early years or your environment or your experiences also play a huge role. However, I, I completely believe that you can definitely be somebody who would like to be different from what your environment had been. Let me give you an example. I know of a gentleman who had undergone a very, very traumatic and uh, abusive childhood. When I say abusive, I don't think he was abused directly as much, but he had witnessed his mom being a victim of domestic violence and he had experienced poverty as well. However, when he grew up into an adult, it gives me a great joy and actually quite a lot of pride to, to tell you that he is currently one of the most responsible people I've come across in my life. Be it his profession, he is currently a musician, and his, the way he takes care of his family and how he is interacting with others, no one would ever probably realize the kind of environmental trauma that he may have experienced. And of course, having come from a home that had broken up due to uh, uh, one of the parents, that the father being an alcoholic, he could have also maybe he had a belief system which may not have been what he has today. But he had chosen to learn from that environment and created for himself a life that is very promising and extremely positive. So I think you don't necessarily have to base your beliefs on your family environment or your growing up environment, but you, it can be a mixture of both. For example, Abhinav, I think I would always like to take up beliefs which I consider are truly worthy to learn. 
uh, from everyone around me, rather than consider that the only beliefs that I was taught as a child by my parents and my loved ones, only they are the most important. Because the more I tend to be rigid about such beliefs, it's very difficult for me to learn and keep learning during the journey of life. I understand that when we speak about this, you come from a very beautiful model of thinking where uh, you kind of try and adopt the belief systems that you know are empowering. And that is the way to do this, actually, even for the listeners, if they're listening, you are not defined by what has happened. You are not defined by what you think you are. It's got to be a stronger belief system because it all starts and ends in the mind. But at the same time, Sita, have you come across people who had, uh, you know, their mental models or ways of thinking uh, a little constricted because of their experiences in life? Do you help them with any breakthroughs? Yes, I have. Actually, I have come across cases where someone may have had such a traumatic uh, life when they were a lot younger that it's very difficult for them to trust. Right. Now, trust is also a quality. Uh, I think that also gets very greatly affected by the, gro the growing years. So I, I remember there was a case of uh, one young lady who had undergone a lot of trauma when she was growing up. In fact, she had even ran away from home because she could no longer tolerate the abuse and uh, the emotional and the physical abuse she was going through. Right. And, I, yeah. and I had got in touch with her. And during uh, the course of our interactions, uh, there, there was a time when um, I had also mentioned to her that I had actually given her a, a small little surprise on her birthday. And uh, I remember her words because she said that uh, no one has ever, ever done anything like that in her life. Wow. And it was something so, so very small, Abhinav. Yeah. So, uh, so very small. And I, I was, I felt, you know, it, I, I felt actually the first thought that struck me was that, oh, I'm, I'm so happy that I thought of making her happy. And then I thought it, it's so sad that for so many people, the, that the moments of joy, which many of us take for granted, is something which they have never experienced in their entire life. So I, I think uh, definitely there, there are cases where the belief systems have undergone so much of a change because of the hardships experienced that it's very difficult for them to start accepting mm -hmm. and open mm -hmm. themselves to the joy of knowing people without suspicion. Because um, I think when, when, when we talk about that, I think I need to mention about my dad here because years ago, I remember my, my father was someone who was extremely, extremely generous. And uh, yeah. there have been so many people who have cheated him. <laughs> In fact, out of his uh, you know, hard earned money as well and uh, cheated him left, right and center. So one day I told him, you know, every time I see him getting cheated, I ask him, why do you keep trusting people the way you do? In the sense, isn't it better you are cautious and then when they prove themselves to be worthy of trusting, you trust them. Mm -hmm. And he said that mm -hmm. he would never want to do that. I said, why? Because he said it will take away his joy of living happily. And when he said that, I initially thought, oh, he's being rather naive. He's such a you know, lovely, adorable, loving man. But he's so naive. That's what the thought that came to my mind. And today, looking back, I, I agree with him, Abhinav, because I think the more and more we are rigid in, in terms of our belief, even in terms of people, we actually take away some of the joy we are able to get from that relationship because we are already creating a barrier. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I, I think that is something, it, it's like you are being vulnerable, but you are being vulnerable Knowingly. with intent. Yes. With intent. In the sense, if you find someone, just like how I had uh, misguidedly mentioned to him that why don't you be careful and then you open up yourself when you realize the person will not take you for a ride and he told me, no, it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. That you allow people, get, get to know people and if people then prove you wrong, fine. 
but not that you keep yourself surrounded by a barrier so that you never get to know people you never get to know new learning and you never get to know new experiences that will enable you to become a better person and help others also to become better yeah, i i i remember uh, back in my mba days we had negotiations and bargaining as one of the subjects and one of the major things there was every interaction that you have with anybody is a negotiation and when you go into that negotiation uh, situation you either start with a place of trust or you start with a place of mistrust and uh, some people always begin with mistrust they're always cautious worried that the other person is out there to cheat them and there are some people who always irrevocably always start with a position of trust no matter how many times they've been cheated because that's what makes them enter that situation in the best empowered way possible and i think your dad comes from that place as well where he wants to trust and uh, see the good in the other person and that's what he because that's what he expects himself that's what he expects from the other person and more often than not that's a very beautiful way of engaging in any interaction with anybody where you are starting from a place of trust allowing the other person also to feel empowered rather than creating a barrier and you know not allowing yourself or the other person be their true selves and uh, miss out on so many important interactions or other things that could have happened in that engagement yeah, yeah absolutely abhinav and i've also been been very pleasantly surprised because sometimes sometimes uh, i think when was i think it was probably a, a couple of years ago i had just wanted to do uh, an experiment uh, as part of my learning on how the voice can actually create a barrier mm-hmm. and need not create a barrier so i remember i had uh, once uh, approached a, a lady sitting i think it was a lady a receptionist in an office and i went and i said that oh hi i want to meet somebody in in a very muffled uh, you know, tone in a very muffled and uh, there was no interest about uh, an interest regarding her or anything Good. and i spoke to her and her reaction was exactly what you would expect and absolutely she is blameless because how you are also communicating with somebody will also decide a lot a lot i won't say completely but a lot on how the other person will respond correct and then there was another incident i decided okay i'm going to take another approach and i went to that person and said hi how are you lovely morning how are you doing hmm. immediately mm-hmm. there was such a glow on the person's face and the person said yes it is a lovely morning how can i help you and when i said i would love to meet so and so i have an appointment they said please why don't you sit down and have something would you like to have some tea so i was i was just uh, fascinated by how much it creates a difference abina the so called openness this the so called trust that we would like to give to people it's a, it's a, it's a trust with which is very conscious hmm and it is also backed with intent in the sense it's not that you are without realizing being vulnerable but you're consciously choosing to be vulnerable so we've covered the learning aspect with sita we've covered how to execute on your goals once you've got the learning through making sure your belief systems are in place and you are with intent trying to adopt more empowered states of belief systems so that you can then move on to the stage of action and coming to action sita something that's very interesting for me i once i uh, i'm done with my day work i also work as a fitness coach with certain clients and uh, when i'm and i'm working with these clients not just from india but also abroad but there's one there's one horizontal there's one simple thing that happens with everyone they are all very excited when it comes to and i'm taking a very brief small example of weight loss here but they are very excited when the aspect of uh, you know the education is given to them uh, we talk about the belief systems also with them that hey this is what's been stopping you from taking action you know on going mm-hmm. on a fitness journey uh-huh. but people end up not taking action sita a lot of times it's happened not just from a fitness perspective but you i know you've seen this as well with people that you work with is this fear of action not taking is it basically a fear of failure or are there other things that are stopping us as an individual to take action i mean, i think it's uh, it's a combination i think of uh, beliefs there 
because uh, sometimes the first step uh, could also uh, not get triggered because of lack of confidence. Because even though you, even I'm sure they are aware that they have a great coach in you, but they might just feel that what if they are not able to reach up to your expectations of them? Because uh, I'm, I'm talking about it from my personal experience, not in a fitness scenario, but in another scenario, sometimes when I find, not now, many, many years back, when there's a situation where someone is out there to willing to kind of, okay, why don't you do this? And you just, the first thought that strikes you is that, would you be able to do it? Right. And do, do you have it in you to make sure you do exactly what it takes for you to reach uh, the goal that you have set out with the assistance of the other person. So I think, I think in, in, in such a scenario, I think what needs to be done is ask them what they are looking at in the sense, forget this weight loss, even though you have approached them as a fitness coach, what is it or why is it that they have come to you in the first place? And what is the reason that they wish to lose weight? Right. Although it's a very obvious answer, or there could be several answers. There could be several ones, yes. Exactly. But what, what exactly is it that has driven them to take help externally? And that could also give you a glimpse of what actually is the reason that they are wanting to go for a fitness program, whether it's due to somebody else's pressure or it's because of pressure from other sources, or is it because of the fact that they would like to be seen by others as looking good? Because uh, for every person, every scenario is so different, Abhinav. Right. In fact, yeah. it, it's like saying what makes you happy need not be necessarily what makes me happy. Right. So <laughs> I think this this is also one, one way of understanding that people who lose weight, there could always be many reasons. And supposing it, 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 in case, I'm just giving you an example, supposing the person is happy about the weight he or she has, but if there's a pressure from maybe a family member or someone whom the, this person cares for a lot, then now that is an external pressure. And if the person is not very keen on the idea of losing weight, that can also work as a detriment when you work with the person because the person isn't completely convinced anyway. But ha have you come across such situations, Abhinav, where the reasons are not as you think they are? I try and understand the whys. Why is it that you're here? Why is it that you want to lose weight? And uh, more often than not, simple technique, a simple idea is like, hey, I have to go for a wedding. Uh, or I'm getting married, or I don't look good in the mirror, are not strong enough wise. Wise, okay. when I've worked with people who successfully transformed themselves, their wise have been much deeper. I've had an experience, I myself was, uh, you know what, I was very heavy, 120, 124 kgs, did a fitness transformation myself. And my why after a long period was my parents. I didn't, my, when I saw my parents worried about my medical reports, when they would see everything shot up and down, I couldn't see that look on their face. And that became my why. That I don't want my parents at their age, now that they're aging, I don't want them to worry about their 20-something kid. About, uh, you know, their 20, uh, 20, uh, 20 plus year old kid worrying about his or her health. That shouldn't be their prime concern. Like So that is what I made my why. And whenever I work with anybody who's had a good fitness transformation, what I've seen is their why is, have been deeper and they've not been governed by external environments, but have been governed more from an internal perspective because it's a process just like uh, weight loss, uh, doing uh, going on an entrepreneurial journey, going for a job interview, anything. There's a process behind it. And if your reasons are not strong enough, not deep enough, not motivational enough, then you will stop after a while because as humans, we are, we are plugged to uh, getting instant feedback, instant uh, gratification. And the mo and all these things require time. There is a process behind it. You have to trust the process. I'm not just talking about weight loss here. 
so the if you are why is not strong enough you will have a debacle you will fall off the wagon so make sure your why's are very uh, strong so is is that does that why uh, of the problem uh, create the uh, fear of action uh, sweet sita yes i i i i think to to some extent yes it does it does and uh, another reason also could be just that the person may not be very inclined to really make the change Right. Because right. it could be because of inertia. Correct. Because when uh, someone has been in in a place where they have literally become very comfortable in, why the change? Right. Is it really right. that important? So to to overcome that kind of a mindset, and at the same time move on to a path of uh, once again we come back to development, all this will be part of the journey, Abhinav. because whenever in fact for example when people tell me that they would like to focus on this aspect of their life because i i also have a mentoring program so when they talk about that i i always tell them i completely believe that if you want to make a change in your professional journey you need to make the change in your personal life absolutely absolutely <laughs> because it has to be so very deep rooted the change that you are bringing about that naturally it will bring about the desired change not just in one area of your life but your whole life correct okay. i was recently speaking to a hypnotherapist and he talked to me about i asked him when is it that hypnotherapy might not work for somebody or an nlp mm-hmm. or any of these so he said there's something called a secondary gain secondary gain which is what you were also talking about that sometimes the brain or your psyche does not want you to go ahead with that change because it perceives something else as a gain of uh, some of not doing it becoming the gain which is what you pretty much said that sometimes you find solace in being in that state of being and any movement from there is not strong enough for you to make any change which is a very dangerous place to be in and uh, now no no absolutely in fact actually when when you when you look up when you look at those reasons you will also notice that uh, as far as development goes the initial areas that you are focusing on in terms of your personal development that will invariably affect your professional journey as well for example like you just mentioned you are into fitness as far as your coaching goes and if when you when a person takes care of their physical and their emotional well being and they discover who they are they start being self motivated they start focusing on communication skills also which we know is so very crucial and then it just kind of starts falling into place like the time management skills that you require how do you manage your stress are you managing it effectively creating the life that you desire and of course one of the most important questions that i ask my clients is do you treat yourself well because that also makes such a huge difference in the impact as far as your growth and progress goes because if you are not able to treat yourself well the way you treat and respect others it's very difficult for you to take yourself seriously enough to be someone whom you need whom whom you know needs to work on their areas of improvement uh, having some gratitude for your own self is very important because unless and until you're not comfortable Correct. in your own skin you really are not going to be able to uh, achieve as much as you want to because you're always at some deep uh, psychological level if i might say are doubting yourself which pretty much that pretty much that small seed in itself is enough to kind of you know throw away whatever plans that you have that you want to achieve or that you want to create so self gratitude absolutely see the right bang on point thank you for that so now if i were to as- assume this as a sphere of three mm-hmm. places learning uh, belief systems and then action and on top of this sphere let's assume uh, a light of uh, positivity because now i'm talking to you about positivity because i know that is something that you try and impart through your training sessions i know that you authored and co-authored books around that uh, that that topic so sita if i were to ask you what is positivity what exactly is this phenomena in fact uh, you know whenever people talk about positivity 
I think they, there's always a doubt which they have when they ask the question, which I definitely hope you don't have, Abhinav, which is when a person is believing in positivity, whether the person is negating that there are situations where it may not be possible to be positive. No, absolutely no. you're right. It's not uh, denying the the negative aspects of thoughts that you're having. It's definitely not that. And I, I hope I'm right from that side. <laughs> You know, because, you know, I, I have been, you know, how is it possible is a question because basically positive thinking, it's, it's a mental and emotional attitude, which focuses on the brighter side of our life and the expectations that there will be a positive outcome. Okay. So I, I would say the having a positive mindset is making sure that you have positive thinking as a habit so that you're continuously searching for a silver lining in any situation. In fact, uh, I think there is one example which I would like to share with you here, uh, Please, yes. Abhinav, because in fact, that, that, was, that was, I think, one of those experiences in my life which actually taught me that we need to be so much more grateful, so much more grateful than what we are. In fact, it was around uh, two and a half years ago and uh, we were part of some, we were part of a major flood. I'm sure you must be recalling the Kerala floods, Correct. Correct. Which, which happened in 2018. Yeah. And uh, my, da my dad wasn't keeping well. He was critically ill with uh, uh, stage uh, four of lung cancer. And uh, we had to rush outside because our house, the, the floods had reached our home and our home was also beginning to get flooded. So as uh, fortunately, my, my parents were on a boat and while I was moving towards the next town with my children through the floodwaters, I was feeling so grateful, Abhinav, because I could see around me there were people who were elderly and who were struggling to walk through the floods because I know my parents would not have been able to walk uh, almost two, two hours to the next town in, in those floodwaters, which had so much of current. And plus, uh, my mom is also elderly, so I know she wouldn't have found, she would have not been able to move that or walk that long. And there were people with small children as well. And I thought, oh, thank God, my children are grown up because I wouldn't be able to hold both of them. Correct. And my parents are safely on a boat and I'm able to walk with my children to the next town. And if I was, I think if, if I wanted to focus on all the things that were going wrong, I do admit, yes, there were things going wrong. <laughs> so it's not that I'm ignoring what was going wrong, but I was wanting to consciously think about what are the things that I can feel grateful about uh, during a crisis of that nature. And that is what I would say, uh, I would always encourage people to, to think and make it into a habit because it's, this is not... Uh, a state of mind, at least for me, it did not come automatically, Abhinav. Mm -hmm. it, it was a very conscious choice of thinking, which over a period of years, I had developed. Wow. Because wow. I, I, I noticed that given a tendency, I think I'm not sure about everyone, but I know if I were to look at myself and if I allowed my mind, okay, once in a while, if I just remind my mind, you know, you need to be more grateful. My mind may not necessarily like to stick to it. So every time my mind is wanting to think, oh, but what about this? I always try to bring it back and say, oh, but there is so much more wonderful things happening. So many more things to feel grateful about, happy about. And so that feeling of appreciation and blessedness. So I think the more and more we consciously strive to think in, in that manner, definitely positive thinking and your attitude of positivity is something that you would start noticing as part of your life. Wow. Because uh, what I also believe is people with positive attitude know how to live life to the fullest, uh, Abhinav. I mean, I, when I look around, I do see people and, uh, and I know it's not that those people have everything going rosy, no. But whatever they have, they are making the, the best of it. 
and they are also uh, not just appreciative of it, but they thrive in the life they have. So I, I think it's, it's I think it's very very important to develop this attitude because it's very necessary for progress as well as much as for the happiness in our life. I had read somewhere recently that uh, people need to understand the difference between happiness and positivity. Happiness is a state change. Now I'm having an amazing day as Abhinav Sita is having an amazing day. One email from my boss or one email from anybody that you're working with, which is not a nice email and your state changes. Your happiness goes away for that day somehow and your state has changed. But positivity where you are always understanding that nothing is going to be, you know, there is no end or there's no start and end. You're having bad times, then it goes away. And then the positive time comes. Just that basic thought process of understanding that this will not last forever. This shall also go. Uh, if I'm not wrong, a more mature way of looking at things, not just from a work perspective, but even a life perspective. Do you think that's fair? I believe so, uh, Abhinav. To, to a great extent, what you say makes complete sense. But right. what I would what I would like to, I think, highlight here is the fact that whatever state we are in, uh, whether there are lots of things which are working in your favor, and whether there are things which may not be working in your favor, like you said, every moment in our life, they are, they, there will be changes, uh, Abhinav. So I think whether it's happiness or whether you're talking about positive thinking, the approach to life and the approach to moments in life need to be such that, all right, this is where we are. Okay, that's, that's wonderful. And at the same time, if you are facing something which is not so wonderful, all right, how do we move forward? What are the ways we are able to overcome this challenge? In fact, which also brings to my mind, there's a very famous poem by, uh, sorry, it's, it's by Rudyard Kipling. Rudyard yes, Kipling. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. The, the poem's name is If. Now, this was a poem which was written by uh, Rudyard Kipling for his son. And, and what is so beautiful about this poem is that it, it basically talks about how you need to handle success and failure. So no matter if, you are being literally taken by people on the shoulders and you are being praised and you are being talked about in a lot of lovely language. How down to earth are you? Are you still humble enough? Do you have your feet on the ground? At the same time, when you have perhaps an unfortunate situation where there might be a lot of criticisms coming your way, how are you handling it? Are you able to handle it in a calm manner? So I, I, think, I think what we need to consider here is whether it's happiness or positivity and whether it's also a traumatic situation. How much inclined are we in terms of maintaining the state of mind that we would like to be in? What do you say? Absolutely. The more your state of mind is regulated, the more you would be able to, I mean, it's a long journey for everybody. At least for me, I know it's a long journey, but it's, a, it's the right path to be in, to be able to have a regulated state of mind so that when you're at the highest of highs, you understand that that time of highs is never going to last. And when you're at the lowest of lows, you realize that, that this shall also pass. And to have that sort of thinking in both the upper echelons and the lower echelons of your life can maybe help you break through certain thought patterns and have a, have a systematic way of, you know, doing well in life. Because at both uh, being very happy and, you know, not thinking about anything else also does not give you full clarity of how you, your feet needs to be on your ground. And when you're totally low and in that state of mind, you're again not having complete information of how you can come back and be in a regulated state of mind. So thank you so much for that, Sita. And uh, as we come towards the end of the podcast, something that I wanted to ask you, and I, I don't know if this is going to make 
a very big question but i thought i might as well ask you what is your please practice do, please do. what is your practice of you know uh, making sure you have a regulated state of mind how do you define something self motivation for yourself so how i maintain i would say my uh, self motivation is uh, it, it generally like if i am to let's just say talk about my day i would say it starts off with a prayer before i even get up from my bed and uh, you know whether it's my exercise uh, my uh, yoga and i i focus a very uh, very consciously i focus a lot on gratitude and appreciation because i have found that apart from making you look at situations more positively it also enables you to be looking at things with a certain humility correct and i'm not yeah. sure exactly how humble i am but i've been very blessed to have uh, two parents who are extremely humble correct. my parents are very very simple and humble people so much so that uh, people who have known them many many years ago maybe around 30 years ago and they see them they or they always uh, remark that they are still the same in terms of how they behave and treat people which i think is one of the best compliments a person can get because life can always teach us or uh, treat us very differently how we start off on a journey and maybe years later god god um, god willing you do extremely well you may not even be aware or we may not even be aware of how much our behavior towards people changes correct so when when someone is remarking on that i think that's a beautiful compliment and from what i have my my dad is no more he passed away 2 years ago in fact this is the third year that he's no more with us but my mom is with me but what i have noticed as a child uh, living with my parents is that um, the more and more we are appreciate you know, we tend to appreciate the more and more we are conscious of the blessings we are enjoying and at the same time it enables us to focus on what we can do better and uh, how how well we are able to do and in that process are we reaching out to others are we also enabling people to lead a better life and leading a better life need not be through financial help alone as you know abinav correct it, it can always be maybe just sharing whatever learning you may have it could just be sometimes a sympathetic uh, ear when someone wants to share something or some things things of that nature as well but what are you doing about it so i that, that's another thing which i think i would like to mention here abinav as far as self motivation goes especially my self motivation uh, how i keep myself self motivated is also by helping people mm. i i mm. don't profess to be doing a lot in that area but whatever little i do i'm extremely happy because that that's also a way of uh, helping people benefit from what i have gained in my life beautiful i love that thank you so much for sharing that and yes gratitude uh for yourself gratitude for every other thing that you face and i have in life thinking about things bigger than yourself uh while it sounds amazing you are absolutely right sita because it also has scientific explanations behind it the more gratitude that you practice the more uh you know good things that you do they automatically light up certain <clears throat> areas in your brain that uh, are then correlated to having an overall well regulated state of mind they release certain and i'm just getting into the the chemical aspect of these things because they 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 take out certain uh chemicals in your brain maybe endorphins or oxytocin however those might be that, that become your reward generation center so when you do something nice for self you are somebody you train your mind to release those uh, those uh, chemical substances in your brain and bring you in a very calm state of mind which pretty much is the fulcrum of everything that you can do well uh, to focus on the present and be able to you know make sure that whatever dreams you want to convert into reality they can happen because you're no longer time traveling between the past 
no longer anxious about the future, but just in the present with, uh, with a regulated state of mind. So absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and I think uh, if we are able to enjoy every moment this way, I think uh, our entire life will, will have a different meaning for us. Such, such nice thoughts towards the end. Thank you so much, Sita. How can people, how can people get in touch with you? You know, they want to know more about you, want to maybe get trained or mentored by you. How do they reach out to you, Sita? In fact, uh, they can actually contact me on my email, uh -huh. which is uh, uh, Sita Sagaran, that is S-E-E-T-H-A, S-A-G-A-R-A-N dot I-E-E -E at gmail.com. Or they can also uh, contact me through my website, which is www.beyondhorizon.biz. Perfect. Perfect. So what I'm going to do for the listeners is I'm going to put both uh, Sita's website and all other information that we have in terms of even her email address to get in touch with her in the show notes so that anybody who's listening to this, I'm sure you're going to take out great value. You can go ahead and also get in touch with Sita directly. So thanks again, yeah. so much, Sita. This was a great pleasure speaking with you. We covered so many important topics that I know the listeners will take great value out of. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Abhinav.